This is Tom Fox. Welcome to this episode of Everything Compliance. Today we have the gang of Jonathan Marks, Matt Kelly, Jay Rosen, and Tom Fox. We take up the topics of Stericycle, the first energy matter, where oligarchs are hiding their yachts and the search for their monies, and a perhaps change in DOJ focus on FCPA enforcement, all on this episode of Everything Compliance. Shoutouts and rants, follow the commentary. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live edition of Everything Compliance. Today, we have Matt Kelly, Jonathan Marks, Jay Rosen, and myself, Tom Fox, sitting in. We are thrilled to be with you, and if you have any questions for our panel, please use the chat function. So, Matt Kelly, what has been on your mind? Well, Tom, I thought we would maybe kick off this session talking a bit about Stericycle, which is the biggest FCPA enforcement action we have seen this year, I think, so far. Also one of the only ones. But uh, So this happened about 10 days ago, I think, that Stericycle, which is headquartered in Indiana and is a medical waste disposal business, they settled FCPA charges with Justice Department, Securities and Exchange Commission, and Brazilian law enforcement. $84 million in penalties and disgorgement. Three-year prosecution, uh, deferred prosecution deal. Two-year independent compliance monitor. All for misconduct that happened in the early 2010s, probably the first half of the 2010s, down in Latin Mexico, Brazil, Argentina seem to be the primary places where uh, the employees ran a rather disciplined bribery scheme, to be honest, when you get into the details of this. Uh, it really isn't anything we haven't heard before. In some ways, uh, they involved sham third parties. They used secret spreadsheets. Uh, we've heard that many times before. I'm sure we will continue to hear it. Although what really struck me was more the embedded nature of the misconduct that was happening there. I don't know how long before the misconduct had been happening, but Stericycle in the late 2000s, early 2010s, went through this rapid international uh, expansion where it was acquiring local medical waste disposal businesses throughout Latin America and then keeping those same local managers in charge. And they also were keeping their same accounting systems that they'd always used. So Stericycle never really centralized all of its financial reporting and internal control capabilities. Uh, so you wound up with all of the same people doing the same thing they'd always done, using the same systems they always did in highly corrupt countries. And so lo and behold, we still had corruption that was happening clear through until I think 2016. Um, you know, I, I, if we wanted to talk a bit about the nature of the third parties and due diligence failures, we could, we've done that before. We probably will in other cases, but what really struck me was more the deeper issues here is that Stericycle never took the steps necessary to reorganize the corporate culture of the acquired businesses and bring in new management or otherwise communicate that no, what you have always done will not still be happening. All of that organizational culture change that should happen with an acquisition, it you know, looks to me from what I read that it didn't. Um, so to a certain extent, I kind of wonder like, well, what else did we think would happen? We have a lot of employees who lived in highly corrupt markets before. They're still there and the highly corrupt activities still happened. Uh, in fact, the, the one striking thing to me was not that Stericycle's Latin America employees were using spreadsheets to track their bribes. That's always happened. It's more like they use their spreadsheets in really sophisticated ways. Uh, they had embedded formulas to calculate the necessary bribe on the basis of the value of the contract. Uh, they were recording the profit gains from various bribes that were paid. Uh, you know, they clearly... There was a lot of talk in these uh, settlement documents about the employee, not so much consultants and intermediaries, which we've seen in some other places. Uh, but so there was that culture inertia 
was one issue that I saw. And then the other thing that also struck me was on the internal controls part, this lack of changing up and centralizing the internal control and financial reporting systems at Stericycle's many business units. So if you don't have the visibility into what's going on from headquarters, well, that's the internal control analog of the corporate culture stuff I was just talking about a moment ago. Uh, you don't have any visibility into what's really happening with the finances, and you don't have any new message from the top that we're going to do things in a different way. I keep coming back to that you know, kind of point that I said before. What else did we expect might happen here? And so we had a fairly egregious set of facts that are in the settlement documents. Um, and we wound up with a fairly severe or unpleasant uh, FCPA settlement. Now, since 2017, Stereocycle has brought in new management. They are building up their compliance program, but they didn't self-report this misconduct. They still are not yet done with testing of their compliance program that they have built. Hence the monitor. It does show that when the Justice Department talks here about being more vigorous in using compliance monitors, they're serious. They're doing it. This is happening right now. Picture perfect example. Uh, so it's just a good meaty case to see, even though the actual misconduct now is a bit dated because the most recent was at least about six years ago. Um, but that's that that's the interesting news in FCPA world these days. So, Matt, I think a lot of people want to ask you questions or have comments. So I'm going to start with Jonathan Marks. What do you have for Matt? You know, Matt, you, you talked about um, kind of these hidden spreadsheets and sort of these other um, clever ways to conceal the behavior. You know, it's interesting to me. There's There's been a great big push of recent and a lot of pressure placed on internal audit. Um, this is, and in 2010, that's actually pre-compliance before yep. compliance really started, right? At yep. least in a big way. I mean, it existed in, in, in various forms and factions, but not as formalized and, and as it is today. So I guess my question for you is, I mean, you read a lot and write a lot about these things and you see what's going on. You know, is internal audit really responsible here as well? Because I didn't see anything when I read that about internal audit. And maybe I missed it. Um, I, I read through a quick the other day. But I just want to get your sort of your, 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 your thoughts on all of that and how internal audit should play a role in these companies. Because, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that a lot of these internal audit shops just don't have those risk management or those forensic skills, in particular when it relates to cross-border activities. Yeah. I think that's a good point, because if you do read through the Justice Department settlement, the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission order, internal audit does not really have any significant role in or you know, not many mentions in all of those documents. So I do wonder where were they? Uh, but I suspect the bigger point is probably they were not up to the task or I'll get away from Stericycle and say we have seen in recent years several big settlements that are kind of sort of like this story of a business that rapidly grows internationally. Uh, this happened with Quad Graphics in Latin America. It happened with WPP in the uh, South Asia and the Middle East, where the headquarters really didn't have, either didn't understand the strategic challenges they were taking or didn't care about them, that if you're going to grow that fast, you're going to have a lot of compliance issues. And so in theory, internal audit could help in a couple of different ways. They could help by counseling the audit committee and the board that if you want to do this big strategic shift, you're going to have a big need for compliance and we might not have the resources yet to do that. So perhaps either a big investment in compliance or curtail your strategy. Now, that might be a difficult conversation for some internal audit people to have because really you're getting to auditing strategic risks and that can be tricky under the best of circumstances, especially if you're going to tell the board that maybe your big strategy is too high risk and we're biting off more than we can chew. So there's that. But secondly, uh, yes, you know, the internal audit team will really need to prepare itself to scale up 
you know, audit all of these individual operating units. That's a lot. Let's audit more of our enterprise ability to control all of these individual units. Why do we have 30 different accounting systems for 30 different acquired local units in 30 different countries? Um, how are we going to centralize all that? Um, audit could be a great resource to help answer that question, except if the board and senior management aren't really interested in thinking about that question at all, then at some point you will have a rendezvous with uh, the Justice Department and other regulators like we've had here, like Quad Graphics did, like WPP did. And I suspect that there are others. It's all about rapid growth means strategic challenges are coming. Can, you know, who at the board will think about that? Can audit help them there? Can audit help with the mechanics of a set risk, recommending good solutions? Point, because I am confident this is not the last time we will hear about a big company doing exactly this sort of thing. Yeah, and I kind of set you up a little bit and I'll make my final comment and I'll, I'll pass it off to Jay. It's interesting to me when you see sort of these deferred prosecution or settlement agreements, there seems to be a great emphasis on the compliance program these days. But I don't really see a lot of these things really pounding on internal audit. And I hate to keep pounding on internal audit. But for me, if you have an organization or any organization that operates like that, shouldn't that be a symbiotic relationship? Shouldn't there be internal audit and compliance working together? I don't see the DOJ or the SEC commenting on internal audits plan or, you know, their resources for internal audit. We see compliance and they specifically call out compliance. And we all know about being adequately resourced. Right. But at the end of the day, you know, is compliance the ones that are running around doing all of the testing and the internal control work or is it internal audit? So I'm more confused than ever today because I really don't know where internal audit sits anymore. seems like they were kind of just kind of squeezed aside. And there's this big, huge pressure placed on compliance now and the compliance program to solve everything. I'm not so sure that's the answer. That's a very good point. Jay, do you have a question or comment for Matt? Yeah, I've got a question. It's a two-parter, Matt. You said some of this most recent activity could be as dated as six years ago. Part A, Brazil, still Brazil. And number two, uh, one data point, but do we think this could be the tip of an industry? Uh, um, I, what, what's, it, what, what's it called when you go after other like-minded companies, industry? It's called panel <laughs> <laughs> Well, like I, I'll tackle the second one first. I, I mean... I think what's more interesting isn't it's not a sweep by industry and I don't know if it's a sweep at all, but to my observation point, it seems like this is the third case we've seen in a roughly the, the last 18 months where the enterprise and its problems look the same. We see rapid expansion outside of the home country into emerging markets by acquisition and then you leave the local people in place. It's not necessarily wrong to leave the local people in place. Uh, I've been on the receiving end where my business units were acquired and I got left in place, which was nice because I wanted the job. Uh, but you need to either you know, bring in additional people to show that corporate headquarters is a different corporate culture and we're going to do things differently. Or you need to drill it into those local unit leaders who are still there that, you know, whatever you did before, this is what we're doing now. Um, so, you know, it was quad graphics a while back. It was WPP last year. It is now Stericycle. Same basic pattern, rapid expansion internationally, acquiring local units, not really understanding what that brings. Um, as to Brazil, I will put Brazil aside. I would be remiss if I didn't talk to one detail about the Argentina people uh, because they recorded their bribes as an Argentine sweet cookie known as Alfa Jores. And uh, my in-laws are from Argentina, and I told them this detail. And so right away, they stopped and they asked me, so like, do all the companies in Argentina pay their bribes and just record them as alfa jores? This being Argentina, I'm not sure. That's a very fair question to ask about Argentina. <laughs> Pro maybe. And the Argentine in-laws also agreed that, yeah, that's probably the case. Um, but it was definitely a, a, one of the more colorful details I've seen in the bribery world. Thanks. 
Matt, I'd like to pick up on a couple of points you raised in the context of the Lisa Monaco speech or the Lisa Monaco doctrine from her October 2021 speech. You mentioned the corporate, the imposition of a corporate monitor, uh, and I'd like to tie that to, for reasons, or it was stated in the deferred prosecution agreement that although the company had put a compliance program in place, it had yet to test that. So query, uh, why haven't they tested their compliance program after having worked on this matter for some time? Two, uh, the DPA went out of its way, I thought, to make clear they knew the names of the individuals. Latin American executive number one, uh, Brazilian chief executive or executive number one, two, three, the same in Argentina. And I wondered if that may lead us to some additional um, individual prosecutions that have yet to come to the fore. And then the third part was the perhaps the most uh, controversial part of the Monaco Doctrine, which said that the DOJ would evaluate other regulatory matters or other criminal charges against a corporation. And that seemed to have the largest amount of commentary uh, coming forward or from October to date on the Lisa Monaco Doctrine. But I thought the uh, DPA handled that with literally one line, which said the companies had no prior criminal charges against it. So did you see uh, any uh, deeper uh, meaning or deeper uh, dive from the Lisa Monaco speech in this, in this enforcement action? Well, to be honest, I have not really spent too much time thinking about that specific question, although it is interesting that if they start talking more specifically about, well, this company has had no prior criminal charges, that's a big jump from what they had said last year, where we're going to consider any misconduct in any way, civil or other regulatory enforcement. Um, and, you know, Stericycle works in the healthcare world. It works in waste disposal of health uh, materials and medical waste. But still, if you're brushing up against healthcare, you are a highly regulated business. So I would be curious to see uh, what about civil enforcement? You know, I'll, I'll step away from Stericycle and say what sort of businesses are going to often encounter civil enforcement where maybe in theory the Justice Department would look at that. Consumer finance is probably going to be a big one because the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau currently looks like they want to enforce everything against everybody. Healthcare, you could very easily wind up with state or federal civil uh, issues in Medicare or at Medicaid. Um, there's a lot that could happen there. It is somewhat intriguing to see that, uh, that we are largely silent on that with the Stericycle. But I don't actually know enough about Stericycle's prior brushes with regulators. Like, for all I know, maybe they haven't had uh, much civil enforcement behind them yet. I just, it isn't something that I looked at yet. Jonathan Marks, what has been on your mind? Well, Tom, um, First Energy, um, although I've been reading about it, you asked me to kind of dive in a little bit deeper. Um, kind of interesting when you get to the the meat and potatoes of this one. Uh, I went back and started to look at a little bit of a, a timeline related to this. And it's, and it's kind of crazy. You know, it, it involves House representatives and speakers of the houses in Ohio and lobbyists and, you know, other folks and setting up 501c4s and funneling money and concealing money and all kinds of craziness. And, you know, this, you know, in, in 1997, I think Householder became the representative in Ohio and became the speaker in 2001. He left in 2004. And in 2006, there was an investigation that was closed on him, which is kind of interesting. You know, they say it was, he says it was politically motivated. So then you have this sort of alleged bad actor who gets exonerated, you know, based on the investigation technically being closed or maybe exonerated is too strong of a word. Then in 2016, he wins a house seat and um, and you could follow it all the way forward. And I can go through piece by piece by piece by piece by piece. But, you know, at the end of the day, you see money going out. You see a business that is in trouble and you see people scrambling to at least glom on to whatever they possibly can politically in order to help them out. And this a lot of this surrounded two nuclear power plants and eventually, you know, a first energy filing for bankruptcy, Chapter 11 protection under the bankruptcy code. 
Um, so, you know, it's to me, it's 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 really no different than looking at a, a normal company with trying to pull revenue or maintain their revenue. It seemed like there was something that was really motivating them or there was a lot of pressure on them. And they have these big concerns. And, you know, this this happened over a number of years. But where we are today, which is is really interesting. And again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so you're going to have to help me here. But, um, you know, there was a, a notice to dis, to depose a representative of First Energy, which I, I think in our world is called 30B6. Right. Um, and, and that's, you know, and that testimony is binding on the company but it's not a judicial admission. And it was demanded that they, they um, conduct an investigation of some, a, a, a deposition of somebody from the company. And um, the interesting thing about that is the individual who potentially could be named to be deposed, I haven't seen anybody named yet, but you don't have a right to remain silent in these depositions. So, um, but you're not expected to basically know everything. So even the questions that they ask, um, you know, this individual might go beyond what they, they know personally. And, 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 and that's really, that's really interesting to me. I, I don't know what they're driving at here or what they want to know. I think there's been a lot written about this. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting that they want an insider's perspective. And, and by the way, since this happened over many years, there is some obligation for the person that is named to make some reasonable efforts to speak with these former employees to really get the story. And so um, I, I'm, I'm kind of scratching my head here, understanding all of this, but there was a deferred prosecution agreement that was entered to with the DOJ. They were fined $230 million to avoid, to avoid honest service wire fraud. You know, and now all of a sudden there's a notice to depose a representative of First Energy. Um, I think there's trials that were scheduled for 2023 for Householder, who is the former speaker, um, who was arrested on July 2020 for racketeering charges. So this whole jumbled mess to me is is kind of interesting, and I, I just wonder where it's all going. Um, and I wonder, I, I also wonder who they're going to name to to be deposed. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Or anybody on, anybody on the group today had any thoughts on that? But it's it's kind of interesting um, if you read through their DPA what they actually say. Again, you know, they gave them the reason that they earned the DPA to begin with. They claimed that they were cooperative and they implemented remedial measures and they were implementing a compliance program and you know um, you know all the key things that you would see see from somebody. Um, who was in this particular situation, but I'm not, I'm not really understanding where this is all going and what the end game is for first energy and, and their shareholders. But I do know that when they, when all of this was going on, their share price plummeted at some point from a high of like 54 or 55, which it grew over that interesting period where they were engaging in all this alleged bad activity. So, you know, I really don't know where it's going, but it's interesting to me that they want to they want to depose somebody from the company. Jonathan, you are the practicing compliance specialist uh, amongst our group today, so I'll pitch this to you. Uh, when you have conversations about U.S. domestic companies, do they understand the need for compliance? And that was one of the things about First Energy. We also had Con Ed, Ed Edison in uh, Illinois, but. Uh, do companies understand that corruption can actually happen inside the United States as well? And uh, you need to uh, uh, prevent that risk internally, or is that something that really doesn't resonate with the folks you talk to? You know, it's kind of interesting that you mentioned that because, um, you know, if you all remember the Daimler case, um, which goes back a number of years, um, uh, Daimler in the U S um, not only was concerned about uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violations, but they were also concerned about commercial bribery and bribery that happened within the within the 50, you know, within the 50 states, so to speak. And so um, my understanding is that they went through and implemented a program specifically related to that. But I don't know very, very many people um, that are in the compliance function that understand 
that it's not just Foreign Corrupt Practices Act issues that they need to deal with. It's also commercial bribery. It's also things that we're talking about with First Energy. So in answer to your question, um, I've never really had a functional conversation with a general counsel or a chief compliance officer other than a Daimler related to commercial bribery. And at the time, the general counsel at, at, Mer at Mercedes-Benz USA was absolutely in tune with this and completely concerned about it. So he's he is the only one out of, I mean, we're going back, oof, what, 10, you know, eight, nine, 10 years already, 11 years. So kind of interesting that it really hasn't popped up at all, or it's listed as a risk for anybody. I haven't even seen it listed as a risk in, in any ERM programs with regards to um, commercial bribery. You see bribery and kickbacks, but a lot of the bribery and kickbacks relate to vendors, but you don't see bribery and kickbacks related to political figures. So I often wonder, but I mean, it's a great point. Matt, do you have a question or comment for Jonathan? Well, just more than a comment. I, I do think it's, it's a good issue to raise. Um, but I, I suppose my frustration with cases like this is we really don't have a consistent uh, approach on the law enforcement side either. Like, A, we don't have a Domestic Corrupt Practices Act on the books. Uh, B, what we do have, any U.S. attorney might prosecute you. Any state attorney general could, in theory, prosecute you. Um, on, in certain states, you could even have several local district attorneys from your, I guess, your local county uh, hassling the company. And, you know, there's multiple ways that you could wind up on local corruption charges. Um, on the other hand, I'm not certain how many politicians would actually get involved with corruption. I know some do, clearly. But and like the lower down you go, the more clueless they seem to be about their complicity in this and like you shouldn't do it. But I don't know that there's that many congressmen who would be actually taking bribes to see if they could get a license done. But like it just shows this is a terribly murky piece of the corporate corruption world that I don't think either side has any clear messages on what they want to do or how to respond to it. Yeah. And I often wonder where the board was in First Energy, too, because. Yeah. Householder did take a flight on First Energy's private jet to Trump's inauguration. Yeah. So, I mean, you're supposed to be reviewing those things. So where's the oversight in that? Why didn't somebody ask a question? You know, what's our relationship with him? Why did he, you know, why was this permissible? See, those types of things to me are the ones that it's the difference between someone who's, you know, sort of skilled in the whole forensics investigatory world and, ones that just say, oh, well, you know, they just let it go. I wouldn't have let that go. But if you don't necessarily appreciate that this is a risk, then you're not necessarily going to have a policy to ask about why are we having a state speaker of the House on our plane flying to a political event? Um, you know, so you're right that if people aren't aware this is a thing, they're not going to then start saying, well, maybe we should have a policy about it. Maybe we should start checking on it. Like everything else falls away if you're can't necessarily grasp that this is a legitimate risk. So Jay Rosen, what is on your mind? Well, I am thinking about oligarch yacht, yacht hunting and how it's energizing the battle against financial corruption. <clears throat> the United States new task force, Klepto Culture, in conjunction with the IRS and global partners, is not only trying to bring down Russian oligarchs, but pushing to overhaul an opaque, secretive financial system. Last week, a court in the Pacific island of Fiji ordered local law enforcement to detain a 348-foot superyacht called the Amadea. It's worth about $325 million, and at the request of U.S. authorities, they were seek seeking to seize this vessel. Amadea's suspected or reported owner is Russian oligarch Suleiman Karimov, the gold tycoon and Federation Council member who was sanctioned by the U.S. in 2018 for alleged money laundering. But is the Karimov actually Amadea's, is Amadea's owner? According to ship tracker Vessel's Value, Edward Kudanetov, the former CEO of state oil giant Rosneft, is the beneficial owner of Nario Management which is uh, domiciled in the Isle of Man and is the 
comp the boat's registered owner. Kudamatov was also linked to the 460-foot Scheherazade in recent investigation by the Italian newspaper La Stampa. Scheherazade, one of the world's largest yachts, yachts, is worth an estimated $700 million and was also recently alleged to belong to Russian President Vladimir Putin himself. The murky ownership of shell companies has frustrated U.S. and EU prosecutors who have been tasked with investigating recent, recent Russian oligarchs. Two months into the war, Western authorities have successfully impounded and frozen many of the super yachts, private jets, and luxury estates. But an unknown number of luxury assets remain hidden by traceless corporations registered in accommodating jurisdictions. With challenges comes opportunity. On March 2nd, the U.S. Department of Justice unveiled the Task Force Kleptoculture, a law enforcement group dedicated to seizing assets of individuals and entities who violate U.S. sanctions laws, according to Attorney General Merrick Garland. Andrew Adams, a federal prosecutor with experience leading organized crime and asset seizures cases, helms the task force, which is being run out of Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco's office. It's getting an assist from the IRS Critical Investigations Unit, which has already been involved in more than 20 investigations since 2017. Klepto Capture and its international partners have also launched the multilateral Russian elites, proxies, and oligarchs, called Repo Task Force, to coordinate intelligence and carry out asset seizures. These task forces are positive initiatives. They could start as something to target Russian oligarchs, but ultimately these tax forces want transparency for all oligarchs and offshore wealth. The hunt for oligarch-owned assets is not only boosting transparency reform efforts, but compelling new law enforcement to prosecute broader financial corruption and white-collar crime. That much was on display on April 4th, when Spanish authorities working at the direction of U.S. investigators seized Tango, a $90 million super yacht found to be owned by Russian oligarch Richter, Victor Vexelberg. The seizure of Tango was the first asset for forfeiture resulting from Klepto Capture's network. The Tango seizure will certainly not be the last seizure of assets belonging to sanctioned oligarchs, Attorney General Merrick Garland promised in a press conference. It's not just words. The IRS Criminal Investigation Division recently requested more funding citing its work in investigating sanctioned oligarchs and similar white-collar criminals. The task force means so much, and not just in the contents of sanctions, they could lead to a totally new area of prosecuting white-collar crime. The more you connect the task forces with more general and broad white-collar investigations, the better for all of us. The U.S. District Justice Department has made sanctions invasions and expert control violations a central focus of its white-collar enforcement program following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The focus should have a profound effect on businesses and their efforts to comply with U.S. laws, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco said recently at a New York bar event. The way the multinational companies have to think about how these sanctions regimes are going to be affecting their business is critically important and something we should do and have conversations about. Bribery has long been the primary focus of federal prosecutors' corporate investigations. The Justice Department's white-collar enforcement efforts increasingly have a national security focus, and as DAG Monaco sums things up by saying, one way to think about the sanctions as uh, their new FCPA. Tom? So, Jay, I had uh, the opportunity to visit with Mary Inman yesterday, a well-known uh, whistleblower attorney, and she had the uh, interesting observation that the – um, fight against kleptocracy and this attempted seizure of oligarch yark, yachts and other properties has actually led to an increase and energize the whistleblower community because uh, under the um, National Defense Act of 2020, which changed the uh, AML law, the monies that are obtained through the seizures of klep kleptocrats, uh, can, uh, there can be a bounty paid. So uh, when I asked her what she was up to, uh, she said exactly that. They're working with several uh, whistleblowers to try to seize oligarchs' property 
uh, because of the potential uh, payout of up to 30%. And frankly, I had not considered that as a um, energization of the whistleblower uh, community. But it, it, it also struck me in, when I paired it with your remarks that uh, this could go a long way towards energizing AML and, and perhaps even anti-bribery corruption. Are you getting that sense as well? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that you um, relayed Mary's remarks and they're saying that, you know, uh, to in, incentivize bounty hunters and get out there. I mean, there are a lot of people who are doing this because it's the right thing to do. But if you can get 30 percent, why not do the right thing and get a little cash in your pocket? All right. So uh, I'm going to take a seat uh, this week because I want to uh, talk about Dick Casson, well known to the compliance community as the founder of the FCPA blog. He's moved on from his editorship and his son, Harry Casson, now runs it. But Dick stays on as an editor at large. And uh, I found that it's uh, I'm not sure if it's conscious or not, but he's it's given him a, a freedom and flexibility to write about a lot of different topics in ways that are, if not highly provocative, have given uh, certainly me pause to think. And I want to talk about one of his blog posts from this week entitled, As Anti-Corruption Compliance Morphed into Corporate Self-Enforcement. And he starts with, uh, his starting point rather, is the decrease in not only FCPA enforcement actions over the past few years, but the amounts of fines and penalties. And, and I'm not going to go through those numbers, but of course, uh, it's a, a, a very stark reminder of the how fewer enforcement actions there are and typically how much less they've been. Now, part of that is uh, due to the Supreme Court uh, holding that the SEC can only go back five years for profit disgorgement. But uh, this is also Department of Justice fines and penalties. But kind of the meat of his argument, or at least the questions he raised, is has the DOJ changed its focus? And has it changed its focus from fines and penalties to uh, getting corporations to uh, essentially self-enforce not only the FCPA, but their own compliance programs. So uh, Lisa Monaco uh, revoked or, or uh, revoked the revocation of the Yates memo. So we have the Yates memo back in place. And uh, I talked about that a little bit in the context of Matt's discussions of Stericycle and potentially could we see more individuals uh, prosecuted because the, uh, the internal investigation has to uh, – turn over all information of all individuals who've been involved and the DOJ will make the decision whether or not to uh, prosecute or not. But she, uh, he pointed to follow-up remarks from uh, the DOJ's criminal division assistant chief, assistant attorney general, Kenneth Polite. He said in a talk uh, in March that we uh, highlighted earlier in this podcast, quote, critically when allegations of wrongdoing surface to receive any cooperation excuse me, credit for cooperation, a, co a corporation must notify the department of all relevant non-privileged facts and evidence about the misconduct and the individual involved. Our policies plainly serve the goal, our goal of securing evidence of individual wrongdoing because the high priority we place on holding individual wrongdoers accountable. So that's on the uh, reinstitution of the Yates memo. On remediation, he said, even if there's not any evidence a CEO personally committed a crime and upon discovery of a crime, a corporation should examine whether a change in leadership is necessary, not for change's sake, but because he modeled poor ethical behavior for the workforce or fostered a climate in which subordinates committed wrongdoing with the intent to benefit the company. So I'd like the listeners or ask our listeners to think about that for a moment. We now have a, uh, Kenneth Polite saying, if uh, corruption occurs on your watch, Mr. or Ms. CEO, uh, perhaps you should be removed. Um, that is corporate regime change. And that is certainly not something we've previously seen from the Department of Justice. And I think it's really taken up um, potentially the pressure on corporations uh, quite a bit. We talked about the Stericycle, or Matt talked about the Stericycle, 
and uh, he didn't go through really all of the remedial steps taken by Stericycle, but they were significant. Uh, they changed uh, senior execs. They obviously put in policies and procedures, but they also created a new compliance committee on the board. They brought in new board members. So they really had to have a clean sweep uh, to get at the true root of the problem, which is, I think Matt identified, was really the culture. And so if you tie all of this together with what uh, Lisa Monaco said in her October speech, that it really is all about culture. Uh, when we have the DOJ suggesting corporate regime change, when the CEO was either not involved or did not know about it, uh, it's taking things to a, to a different level. Uh, I'm not sure that's uh, precisely what the DOJ had in mind, but that's what uh, Dick saw in these talks, Dick Casson. And um, so perhaps uh, the DOJ is moving to more and greater remediation, and uh, perhaps they're moving to uh, not simply compliance program remediation, but overall culture remediation as well. So I thought it was really interesting. I think Mr. Mark says uh, perhaps not. So Jonathan, what's your take? No, because very rarely do you even hear or, or the words governance mumbled out of their mouth. And so in order, everybody forgets the fundamental blocking and tackling here. You have to have good governance in order to have good risk management. And risk management drives compliance. And the governance structure or the governance framework sits on top of culture. <coughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work any other way. It just doesn't. It's not compliance drives risk management or compliance drives governance or any other, it, the formula doesn't work any other way. It's a waterfall concept, and that's the way it works. And everybody talks about building a culture of compliance, and they say it's amorphous and we can't measure it. Yes, we can. We can measure it. We know today that there are certain things that make up a good culture. We know that there are certain actions. We know that it's no longer tone from the top. It's tone and conduct from the top, right? And we can, there are some things that we could do in order to measure this. The fact of the matter is nobody wants to address this because they're afraid of the results. They're afraid that they're going to find out that their culture is crappy and that they have real work to do. And when you have a crappy culture, which is the bedrock in which governance sits on and that tilts everything, it, it, basically, it basically tells you that there's risk somewhere. And it doesn't have to be throughout the entire organization. It could be in certain spots or places or whatever. But the fact of the matter is nobody wants the truth cocktail. Everybody wants to bury it and everybody wants to just talk about it, but they don't want to do anything about it. And so until the regulators start pounding their fists and saying, hey, we're, we've looked at your governance framework and your governance structure, and we can see that there are seven elements here and we see weaknesses in your communication protocols, or we see weaknesses in your boards and your committee structures, or we see weaknesses in the way you look at business practices and ethics, or the way that you, or your disclosure and transparency, the way that you do all that. The fact of the matter is they don't know what to address because they have no experience with that. So get somebody in there that can assess this. Like when Wei was in there and she understood compliance, look at all the good that came out of that. Get somebody in there that understands governance, that can really make an impact on folks, and that can really get corporations to be in line. But until we do this, we're treating the symptom rather than the root cause. Sorry I'm on my soapbox, but that's how I feel. So Mr. Rosen has suggested that we need to uh, channel our inner Tom Cruise, that you can't handle the truth. But frankly, nobody wants a truth cocktail is a much better title. So Jonathan, you... Uh, congratulations. That's the first time we've had the title of an episode articulated by one of our panelists. That's why we're the top uh, panel uh, in compliance. So, gentlemen, with that, we're going to move on to fan favorites, shout outs at Brands. And I'm not sure we can outdo Mr. Mark's last rant, but we're going to try. We're going to keep the same order. Matt, what do you have for us today? Yeah, thank you, Tom. So I'm going to give a shout out this week to the Brooklyn Public Library in New York uh, for deciding that they are going to provide any young student in the United States a library membership and I guess a library card to the Brooklyn Public Library's full electronic book collection. And now, unfortunately, the library is doing this because there is this wave of book banning that is going on in the United States. 
Uh, it is uh, ridiculous, in my opinion. It's largely driven by evangelicals and conservatives and the Republican Party that I am all for a thoughtful approach of what you want to expose your children to, but that is not what is happening here. It is this movement that just keeps going further and further and further. Uh, what really caught my eye was that while the Brooklyn Public Library is doing this, at the other extreme, we have the uh, county of Lano County in Texas. Tom, I do not know where they are. I assume you do. But uh, in Lano County, a group of evangelicals took over the library board, uh, then promptly closed library commission meetings to the public and started yanking books off of library shelves left and right. And this is not the school library. This is the public library for adults. And this is not yanking pornography off of library shelves. These were established books, mostly questioning racism, which of course is what gets conservatives up under the collar. Uh, so we have these book burning, book banning waves all over the South. Um, and finally, it's uh, nice to see the Brooklyn Public Library is trying to uh, take some action against this. So I did not think that book banning and book burning were the most pressing risks and issues in our country. I thought that maybe worrying about COVID or the war in Ukraine or out of control debt or gun violence or something else might be more important. Apparently not for the conservatives and the Republican Party out there. Uh, so at least we have some now trying to offer a solution like Brooklyn Public Library. Good for them. Jonathan Marks. Well, this is going to be ugly. Um, my, my rant is against Comcast and Xfinity and their new supersonic Wi-Fi, which literally doesn't exist. And so I'll, I'll tell you a very, very quick story, but the Wi-Fi in my house, the way the house is constructed, it's very poor. And a mesh Wi-Fi system is really great if you have four, five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks. But Comcast allegedly came out with their mesh Wi-Fi system calling called supersonic. So as soon as the first commercial came out, I called up and I ordered my XB8 modem, which as I sit here today is still not here and won't be here because it doesn't even freaking exist. And after five attempts to get it and actually told yesterday that it was shipped on the 25th without any tracking number and asking them when I was going to receive it, all I got was the hang up. I got the hang up with customer service. And so um, yesterday, for the first time ever in my entire career, and I swore that I would never do this, but I did it, I tweeted and slammed Comcast through my Twitter account. And um, I got a reply from Xfinity saying, direct message me. We'd love to hear what happened. So I will report next week as to what happened. But I think that somebody should look into this because the whole thing seems to be a sham to me. Jay Rosen. Well, my, my ire is not worked up that hard, but I'll, I'll give a little bit here. This is uh, two nominations for Gaslighters of the Week. In one corner, we have MTG herself, Marjorie Taylor Greene. And in the other corner, we have Kevin McCarthy. And evidently, to both these people, no matter whether you say something that's been publicly recorded or has been read out on the other end of a text message, it just doesn't exist, and the American people don't even blink anymore. So I'm uh, kind of, you know, we, we talk about gaslighting, we talk about people, and I guess really, even when you find the facts, the facts don't matter anymore. So thank you for Tom for putting together this panel so we can kind of look for those facts every once in a while, because at least this group of people, we think they are important. Well, I'm going to shout out today, and I'm going to shout out for good corporate governance in the form of the shareholders of Credit Suisse, who revolted and refused to clear Credit Suisse executives of legal liability from financial uh, missteps. Uh, this was at the Credit Suisse shareholder meeting, and 60% of the votes went against Credit Suisse for uh, discharging senior execs and the board from legal liability um, in their recent credit, uh, excuse me, financial steps, Greensill and Archegos Capital. So uh, shout out to Credit Suisse 
shareholders who said enough is enough. We are not going to discharge you from liability and we will go after you in the form of shareholder lawsuits, or at least we won't let you prevent us from doing so. But gentlemen, uh, as always, it's been a great episode. Uh, it's great to see Mr. Marks back on his horse, uh, getting ready for the Derby. Uh, and I can't wait to see what we come up with next time, gents. Thanks, Derby Tom. hats for all. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Everything Compliance. Please join us again for our next episode where we have the gang back to talk about a variety of topics. This is Tom Fox. Everything Compliance or the award-winning Everything Compliance is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.